the boot me. Hey, I didn't realise, but it is Pentecost Sunday. Who knew that? Hands up if you knew it was Pentecost Sunday. That's right. See, I'm not a very big dates person. I don't know a lot of dates. I know my marriage, uh, my wedding anniversary. I know that. I know my wife's birthday. Any date to do with my wife, I know. I've committed that to memory. Um, I know some of my children's birthdays. I know some of their names. <laughs> um, but it's Pentecost Sunday, and, and what an exciting time. Uh, we began, those of you that were here last week, we've started a little bit of a journey. We want to uh, talk about the Holy Spirit. So when, I, when I, we were in prayer this morning and somebody prayed about it being Pentecost Sunday, the penny dropped, I thought, wow, God, isn't God awesome? What a great time to begin a bit of a journey back into these collection of ancient documents, and let's have a look at what they have to say about the Holy Spirit, the gift that was poured out upon us that Pentecost Sunday uh, remembers. Um, if you go with me, just go very quickly with me to Acts. I've got to put my glasses on here. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Very quickly. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I want us to... How many of you know that... Uh, that God has revealed himself to us through his word. He's revealed himself to us through creation. There's different various means uh, that he's revealed himself to us. But how many of us would be humble enough to admit that there are areas of life and understanding about God that I have, that you have, that aren't necessarily formed and uh, conclusions come to based on what God has revealed about himself, but they're based upon my own personal experience. Anybody else like that? Yeah, you, you, we, we, we have all kinds of areas of, of life where we have created... The, now, now, let me... The word theology, some people get frightened at the word theology. The word theology literally means thoughts and words about God. If you break it down, it literally means thoughts and words about God. So every time Jasper sits down and talks to someone about God, you're b doing theology. You're becoming a theologian. Uh, anytime you talk to somebody about God or you think about God realistically you're entering into theology theos logos thoughts and words about god so when we when we think about god we're entering into theology so when when i say the word theology don't freak out and think it's for a special class of intellect if that's the case i've missed the boat um but it's not it's 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 it's, it's those that think and talk about god that's what what theology is and if we're honest i think there are areas of our world where we build theologies based not on what God has revealed, but based on our own experience. Let me give you an example. Um, healing is a great example, right? You have some people that, that will say, God heals everybody anytime at the click of a finger just because you got a gift and he wants you to. <laughs> but we all know that's not true. Who knows that's not true? And, and if you think that's true, then as soon as we're finished, I'm going to take you down to the hospital. And we're going to go through the children's ward because I think it's unfair that those kids be suffering the way they are and you think you've got the flick of a switch answer to their problem. Let's, let's go and do that. But we know it doesn't work like that. Um, so, so what happens is some people might have prayed for somebody once that God would heal them and maybe they didn't get healed. And so what happens is we pray for two or three people, no one gets healed. So we come up with this theology that, well, God doesn't heal anymore. Even though we know from his word, there's nowhere in there that actually says to us, there was a point in human history where God removed his healing power. It's, it's not there. Now, some people will try to say it is. In, in theological terms, they have this, say, this thing, it's an argument from silence. And an argument from silence is really not an argument. It's like it doesn't say anything, but it's not happening. Well, we don't base our theologies just based on human experience because some of our experiences are wrong. Is that right? Some of us have had experiences in life that weren't right. Some of us see things and we misinterpret things and we don't fully understand things. So it's really important as believers in Jesus that we get our theology from what God has revealed to us primarily through these uh, collection of ancient documents that we have had bound together that we call a Bible. These people that walked with Jesus, that were eyewitnesses or that interviewed people that were one or two steps from Jesus himself and documented <coughs> and so on. And, and in Luke's case, the, the history there that he records, the book of Acts is actually a historical document about the first 30 years, uh, roughly, of this movement that we're a part of called the church. So, so, so when it comes to healing, we'll have some people that will go, they'll adamant that God doesn't heal anymore, but they won't be able to give you a, a, a proper answer from here, from these ancient documents as to why it'll more really be based on the fact that maybe I've never seen a healing before, so I don't believe God heals anymore. Does that make sense? 
Uh, uh, maybe I, I've, I've never experienced this, so God doesn't do that anymore. And we have so many theologies that we've built up over the years that are based on experience. Now, I'm very aware when we talk about the Holy Spirit, this is probably one of those areas where a lot of us have built theologies based on experience. So what we're going to be doing in the coming uh, couple of months is we want to lay aside our own personal experiences. Because I, what I did in preparation for this is I went back, I read all of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Just I've started there, the four gospel records. And I wrote down everything in those gospels that pertains to the activity and the person of the Holy Spirit. And I sat back and I've, I've looked at that as a starting point. And you know, there's some things in there I looked at and I went, you know what? Over time, I've been walking with Jesus now since 19. I was 19 when I gave my life to Jesus. I'm, I'm turning 49 shortly. So that's 30 years of walking with Him. But you know, over those 30 years, I've drifted away from certain things and certain beliefs and faith and expectation in certain areas. Why? Just simply because for a period it didn't happen. So I've relaxed on certain areas of, of, of expectation, faith, belief, and, and I realised that I've changed my theology in certain areas. But when I went back and had a look, I went, why, why have I changed my thinking about that when the Word of God is clear, fairly clear about certain things? And I, if I'm honest and I humble myself, it's because over time I've lost that experience. So because I haven't had that experience for a while, uh, when I was uh, uh, 21, I went to India. And, and while I was over in India, I don't want to get into it, I saw the most amazing physical healing miracles. People healed left, right and centre. I lived over there for a, a, a six months as a single guy and, and I could write a book on the miracles that, that, that I saw over there that, that happened through these, these hands, these mitts laying on people and God just doing the most amazing miracles to the point where I, I just had faith. I just knew I, I'm going to lay hands on that person and God is just going to heal them. And he did. I saw, we saw eyes open. We saw guys getting up off mats. I had a baby brought to me once who, who was not breathing. I hate using the word dead. It sounds dramatic, but the child was not breathing and a mother threw the baby, grandmother threw the baby down in front of me. I was in a Muslim uh, compound and we were preaching about Jesus. We normally went to this Hindu part of a village and we're preaching there in this Hindu part of the village and it's a poor lower caste part. And, and we got a knock on the door and this uh, high caste Muslim man came and said, we want you to come to our house. I've got a gathering of people and you need to tell us about this Jesus. And so the Hindu people we were with, we had a house church there, they were so excited about this, they simply said, you need to go, go, forget us, you go, because this opportunity doesn't come. So we went in there and we're preaching and I'm sharing a simple gospel message. And at the end of my messages, I would always say to people, you don't have to believe me. God is big enough to reveal himself to you. So is there anybody sick or anybody want God to reveal himself? Come, oh, I'd love to pray for you because I believe that God is big enough to reveal himself to you. You don't need to take my word for it. And God was faithful. And this particular night, a woman came in with a baby. Uh, she, she, she ran in this grandmother and she threw this, this child, would have been about six, I say baby, about six, threw this child down. I remember it not because of what God did, but because I was so shocked that a grandmother could treat a grandbaby like that. I just, to this day, I can't get my head around it. She threw this child down and said to me, if your Jesus is so uh, great, then, then you, you raise this child up. And I was seeing newspaper headlines, if I'm honest, flashing through my head. You know, the Western missionary kills child. I thought, I'm gone. This is a setup. I'm in trouble. But the interpreter with me, this Indian guy, he said, let's pray. We need to pray. It's all we can do. So, so we prayed. And long story short, this child went, <gasps> breathed in and gets up. And, and, and you can imagine we had an awesome prayer time after that. Just people came from everywhere who wanted to be prayed for in the name of Jesus. But you know what? Over time... Over time, I come back to Australia and I get settled back into uh, life here. And, and you know what? Even, even as a pastor, pastoring a church, you can get to a point where you begin to lose that expectation and you kind of start going through. The, who, who goes through the motions sometimes of their Christian faith? I, I will. I'll put my hand up. I do. You, you get familiar. We talked about this last week. There's this familiar world that you know, but you know it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden you come to faith and you realise that, Life is different than what we were brought up thinking it was. There's a whole new dimension. And so we come over here to Jesus and we begin this exciting journey. But for many of us, what do we do once we get in here? We then try to work out the rules, the regulations, how it all works, and we create another type of familiar. And instead of doing life with, with, with a sense of purpose or instead of walking daily with the Holy Spirit, we don't need Him anymore because we've actually worked out how it works now. We don't even need God. We can do Christianity without Him. You want to understand what I'm saying? We can do Christianity without the very power source, the Holy Spirit. 
And so while we're talking for the next few weeks about the Holy Spirit, I want you to just lay aside maybe your own experiences and I want you to go back to the Word of God and let's have a look at what this book talks about with the Holy Spirit. Is that, is that fair? Can we do that? And look, as usual, I always say, if you've got questions or whatever, um, you know, c- call me during the week, come and see me, happy to sit down and chat. We only have a small amount of time on a Sunday morning. You can't exhaust anything on a Sunday morning, nor should we have to, because I'm sure that each person sitting out there, that you spend time each week in, in the Word of God yourself, you have your own quiet time with the Lord, you pray, you spend time with Him. That's where the, where the, where the, where the power is. Um, so anyway, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And we all know this passage. But you shall receive what? Power. You shall receive power, which is that Greek word dynamis. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses to me and so on. What I want us to, to, to just look at today, the one thought I want to leave you with today is this. On the day of Pentecost, when those tongues of fire fell, Jesus wasn't putting the emphasis on the power. He didn't say you receive power. That's it. What he said was you receive power when something else happens. The primary focus of what Jesus was saying there was not the power, it was the Holy Spirit. He said you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. It's like saying you're going to receive a, Daniel, you're going to receive a bacon and cheese zinger burger when Ruth gets home. When Ruth gets home. So if Ruth doesn't come home, forget the bacon and cheese zinger burger, you're not getting it. But if Ruth comes home, you're going to get the bacon and cheese zinger burger because she's got the bacon and cheese zinger burger with her. It's part of her possession. It's who she is. It's what she's got. And when Ruth comes into that room, you get everything that belongs to Ruth, everything that's in Ruth's possession. You get it all when Ruth walks through the door. And this is what Jesus is saying here. A couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you remember, we went back to Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. And it says that the master distributed to each one according to his Ability. The master gave one uh, ten or one five, one two, and it says that he distributed each according to their ability. What is that word ability? It's the Greek word dynamis. It's the exact same word that's used here for power. And it literally means, here's what it means. I've written it down so I don't get it wrong. It literally means inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So everything that's within the Holy Spirit by virtue of the Holy Spirit's nature, when you get the Spirit, you get all that. Now that's exciting. I don't know about you, I find that exciting. That means that all of a sudden I have this resource inside of me that's an extensive, limitless resource, as limitless as what God Himself is. I have all, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Did you know you don't have to come to faith and then try to externally after that, now I've got to go after the fruit. No, the fruit were inherent within the Holy Spirit. You have the fruit of the Spirit in you. Now maybe they're not being let out, maybe it's not being cultivated, but it's there. It's there. Why? Because by virtue of having the Spirit, you get everything that was with the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit can operate in your life. And don't get hung up on this. We're going to spend some time. We're going to look at the gifts. We're going to look at the fruit as we go on this journey. But the gifts of the Spirit are there by virtue of the Holy Spirit being with you. They're His gifts. You've got the Spirit. You've got the gifts. This stuff is resident within you. You, It's within your reach and your capacity to function and flow in this level of life outside of the normal scope of things. Why? Because when you receive the Holy Spirit, which you got at uh, your salvation point, if you have genuinely repented and turned your heart and faith towards Jesus, Peter says in Acts chapter 2 that if you've done that, then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, the next generation, next, 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 as, as many as the Lord would call. So if you genuinely had a conversion experience where you've repented, turned from your own ways and followed God, then you've received the Holy Spirit. And if you've received the Holy Spirit, you have all this stuff that came with the Holy Spirit. That's exciting to me. That's exciting to me. That means that life now should be or at least has the capacity to be different than it did before I came to faith. Before I came to faith, I worked everything out with my own intellect. I worked it out based on my own power, my own ability and so on. All of a sudden, I come to faith, I get given this promise, this gift of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden now, everything that He has, His wisdom, His guidance, His teaching, His power, His miracle working power, His gifts, all this stuff is resident within me. So part of my Christian journey is about opening myself up and unpacking and working with the Holy Spirit 
to become and to do all that God wants me to be and do. It's an exciting journey. You know, I, 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 you see people all the time. And, and I, I, I know that we go through hard times. I, I have no doubt. I go through hard times. I have tough moments in my life. But in the tough moments, I've got something inside of me that can still sort of keep that spark going because I know that I know that I know that there's another in the fire with me. I'm not doing this by myself. I have the very presence of God dwelling inside of me. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in my mortal flesh. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It makes no intellectual sense to me. But hey, that's what they taught. So I'm just going to believe it. I'm going to believe it. That's the gift that we have. That's the life that we live. It's the opportunity that we have to experience life down here with the spirit as opposed to Without, where we're just relying on our own <coughs> resource and so on. John 14, verse 16 to 18. Jesus said this. He said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He dwells with you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, going, he dwells with you. In other words, I'm dwelling with you right now. I'm here. But there's going to come a time where I won't just dwell with you, but I'm actually going to be in you. That means instead of you having to go to a particular place to hear what I'm saying or to experience my presence, you're going to take that presence with you to whatever particular place you go. Isn't that exciting? You get to take the very presence of God <laughs> to wherever you're going. Now, this is at the same time, by the way, where Jesus has just explained to them. I mean, this is not a spiritual high at the moment when he's talking to them, by the way. Uh, he's just explained to them that one of you 12 are going to stab me in the back. Right? You go back and you read it in John. One of you 12 are going to stab me in the back. That's taking a bit of the wind out of their sails. Then he's basically told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me. That's taken a bit more wind out of their sails because Peter's the big loudmouth spokesperson. That's taken some wind out of their sails. I'm going to be denied. Uh, Peter, you're going to deny me. Uh, and he's also told them that he's about to be crucified. He's going to leave. So th this is not a spiritual high. So you can imagine them sitting around there going, hang on, we put all our eggs in the Jesus basket. That's what we did. We put all our eggs in the Jesus basket and you're, you're, you've just crushed the basket. What, what, is, what is going to happen? And Jesus says, here's what's going to happen. When that's all over, you are going to receive something that's going to way trump the sorrow you feel now with joy. Because I'm going to come and I'm going to fill your heart and I'm going to dwell with you. Now here's the one thing, the one thing that I want you to think about as we begin this journey. And it's this, that fundamental to any understanding of the Holy Spirit is to know that he is a person, not a power. He is a person, not a power. Now, when I say person, I don't want you necessarily thinking he's got 10 fingers and 10 toes and so on. But what I want you to understand is that whenever the Holy Spirit is spoken about, he's spoken about with characteristics of personhood. It's important to know that because you relate to a person different than you relate to some power. Anyone ever seen the Star Wars movies? You know, the force be with you. And, 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 and so many uh, believers think that the Holy Spirit is like the force in Star Wars. You know, the force is strong with this one. You know, you, we look at the fork and we do this and the fork comes flying. We, you know, the, the scene with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, what, what does he say? He says, um, there's no droids here. There's no droids here. Be on your way. Be on your way. We can control people, all this. So many people think that the Holy Spirit is just some kind of a force. But we need to understand that Jesus didn't ever communicate that when I go, I'm going to send you a force. When I go, the thing that I'm going to send you, you're going to relate to him as a force. Jesus didn't give us that option. Jesus didn't give us that option. Jesus made it very clear that when the Holy Spirit comes, the best way I can describe him is that he's going to have characteristics of personhood. Why is that important? Because it's really important because the way we relate to a person is very different than the way we relate to an abstract force. Um, let's have a look. Jesus communicated the Spirit this way. John 14, verse 16 to 18. We just read this. He says, I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will 
come to you. He says he will give you another helper. That, 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 that word another, it's a, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a weird Greek word because some theologians believe it means this, some believe it means that, but a majority of them believe that that word in the Greek, alos, means another of the same kind. That, that, that Jesus is saying that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to be another of the same kind of me. I'm a person and you relate to me a certain way. And I relate to you a certain way. And I want you to understand that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to relate to you in a similar way. There's going to be personhood about the way that he relates to you. Uh, And there's going to be personhood also about the way that I want you to relate back to him. I I, I love what uh, what Luke says in, 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 I think it's Acts 1, 1. He says, the former account, he wrote the book of Luke, then the book of Acts. He says, the former account I made, O, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach all that Jesus began he didn't say the former account I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus did and taught he says of all that he began to do and teach in other words I've written an account of what Jesus started to do now the book of Acts is a continuation of what Jesus is continuing to do in the form of the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, through the church. The work of Jesus continues. This is what Jesus is saying. When I go, another helper will come, one of the same kind. The ministry that you see moving through me is going to continue. Healing, deliverance, preaching with power and conviction, it's going to continue, but it's not going to be just happening through me, one person in the flesh where you all have to be where I am. It's going to come through you wherever you go. As my followers, as my believers, those that have received the Spirit, that helper that's come upon them. That's exciting. Isn't that exciting? Good. John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, again, he will testify of me. Nowhere does Jesus go, it will. It will testify of me. He, he never uses that kind of language. He always speaks as if the Spirit has some sense of personhood about it. John 16, 13 to 14. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, just like Jesus guided His disciples into truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you things to come. Sounds very much like a person, doesn't it? He's going to speak to you. He's going to teach you. He's going to guide you. He's going to be with you. And He will glorify me, for He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So He's going to hear what I've got to say, and He's going to then say it to you. Sounds very much like a relationship between two people. All the things that are going on sound like there's a lot of personhood involved. Now, let me just say this too. The word is translated he, him. In the masculine gender, this particular word in the Greek New Testament, over 3,000 times. There are 240 odd times where it's actually translated she in a feminine sense. So I don't want us, when I say personhood, I don't want us getting caught up on gender. Okay? Remember it says in the beginning, God made the male and female. Male and female, yet they were both made in his image, right? So I don't want us getting caught up on gender. It's, it's a sidetrack that people want to go down. Let's not go down rabbit holes. The point is this, that we relate to the Holy Spirit as we would relate to another person. This is what Jesus is trying to communicate to them, that we can have relationship as the disciples had relationship with Jesus Christ in the flesh. So too, as New Testament believers, you can have relationship with me via the Holy Spirit who I've sent to be with you. Isn't that exciting? That Holy Spirit that's with you, the very Spirit of God that dwells with you. That's what we have access to. Here are, here are some of the other attributes of the Holy Spirit's personhood. Um, uh, the Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Romans eight twenty seven. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he has a mind. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So the Spirit has a mind. Somewhere, and, 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 and I, I think... It's hard to describe God in human terms. Who knows that? But yet, yet, yet we've had to have God explained to us in human terms because we're humans. So, so when I think mind, don't think finite mind like mine. What is, is, is it Isaiah who says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. Then he explains why they're not the same. He says, because my thoughts are way higher than yours. Because I'm divine. I'm God. And you're finite. You're human. And my ways are way above yours. Because I'm divine and I'm God. You're finite and you're human. But again, the description is there for us to understand. So God has a mind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11 For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. 
The Spirit of God knows the mind. He has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. It says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, speaking of the gifts, distributing to each one individually as He wills, as He decides. So the Holy Spirit has a mind, just like persons, just like people do. The Holy Spirit has a will, another attribute of personhood. The Holy Spirit has emotions, Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You ever thought about that? The Holy Spirit in your life can be grieved. The Holy Spirit has emotions, just like a person. I mean, if we could capture just that one truth alone, that the Holy Spirit that walks with you, dwells with you, is in you, is a person walking with you every day. Can you imagine what your life would be like if Jesus in the physical flesh walked beside you all day, every day? What would your life be like? If, if, if Jesus, when you put your family to bed and you went to the office and sat down in front of that computer by yourself with the lamp on, if Jesus was sitting there, do you reckon you might find a little bit of strength and courage to maybe not go where you shouldn't go, not look at that thing you shouldn't be looking at? I reckon, I'll put my hand, I reckon if Jesus was there, it would change what you did. It would change what you talked about. How many of you would sit down with a group of friends and you'd start talking about that other person that's not in the room, that can't defend themselves, and you probably know you shouldn't be having the discussion, but you do it anyway. But what if Jesus was sitting right there? What if you knew that Jesus in the flesh was sitting there? You might bite your tongue. You might find within yourself the capacity to suddenly stop and go, whoops, I better not go there. I heard a story years and years ago about a, a man. He was at a bar and there's this really attractive young lady sitting there and he saunders up to her and he starts trying to chat up this woman. You know, he's, he's sort of flexing himself a bit being a man and, 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 and he's sitting there and, 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 and he's just like he can't help himself. He's, he's just saying, I've got to do this, this is what I do. And then after about five minutes of trying to crack the code, which he didn't crack, the toilet door opens and out walks this guy built like a brick and you can fill in the blanks. And, and this guy walks out and, and he's got tattoos and everything and all of a sudden the guy sitting there, he sees this particular gentleman and in a moment finds within himself the strength and the willpower to get up, turn around and walk away and go to the other side of the room. Where did that come from? It came because of the presence of somebody else that happened to turn up. Imagine what our lives could be like if we actually believed and realised and understood that the presence of God through the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. What would our lives be like, I wonder? I wonder what my life would be like. I wonder what your life would be like if we actually embraced that truth and truly believed it. How different would our conversations be? How different would what we look at and listen to, what we read? Sometimes maybe what we do, some of the things that we do. How different would our life be? If we just embrace that one truth, that the Holy Spirit with me is a person. The Holy Spirit's with me as a person. Acts 5.3, it says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep back part of the price. Of the, the Holy Spirit can be lied to. You can lie to the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? You can't lie to a force, because a force... Force has no emotions, no will, no mind. But you can lie to a person. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. Acts 7.51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. You know, the Holy Spirit can be resisted. You know what You can resist the Holy Spirit. You, you, can be, you can be sitting in a gathering. It doesn't even have to be a gathering. And the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and he's asking you to do something. Maybe it's repent. You know, change your ways in this area maybe you've been to a meeting and, the, and we've probably all experienced this the Holy Spirit starts twiddling away inside there, there, there's a, a word of God's being preached and, and there's something about it and, and the Holy Spirit says I want you to go and ask for prayer but you don't you just sit there and go no I'm not going to get up and go forward for prayer no way and, and, and we resist the promptings and the leadings of the Spirit and what I found in my own life every time I resist the prompting and leading of the Spirit I'm missing out on being part of a miracle. I believe that with all my heart. When I do not obey and go with the Holy Spirit, I believe that I'm resisting being a part of a potential miracle, whether it be my own healing, my own freedom, my own changing of the way I see things, my own setting free, or sometimes it can be being part of the healing or a miracle in somebody else's life as well because I resisted it because I was more concerned about what people might think or, or I was, 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 was worried about getting it wrong or whatever. And so we hold back, we hold back and we don't go there. And we resist the Spirit. Isn't that a, a, a terrible thought? I wonder, anyone in this room, if you've ever resisted the Holy Spirit? 
None of this is going to change God's love for you, and none of it changes God's love for me. He doesn't love me because of my performance. He loves me because of who I am. I'm created in his image, fashioned by his hand, formed in my mother's womb. He loves me unconditionally. But what it does do is it impacts my relationship with him. It impacts my availability to him, and I certainly don't live on this earthly plane with the same power that he intends for me to because I resist him, because I lie to him, because I, I keep things back, and so on. He can be insulted. Hebrews 10.29 Of how much worse punishment do you suppose he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Insulted the Spirit of grace. None of us, none, none of us in this room, I believe, we, we, we don't want to insult the Holy Spirit. Who, who, who doesn't want to insult the Holy Spirit? Who doesn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit? I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to lie to the Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to lie to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus made it very clear, you're going to receive this thing called power. You're going to receive power because it's inherent in the Holy Spirit. It's inherent. It's, it's all the stuff that comes with the Holy Spirit. So if I really want to experience the Christian life the way that God intended us to experience it, we'll never experience it until we learn to relate to and move with and embrace the reality, the power and the life of the person of the Spirit inside of us. Until we get to that point, we will always feel like we're hitting our head against a brick wall. Anyone ever feel like it's two steps forward, two steps back in your Christianity? I can go to a camp, get pumped up emotionally, and that's great. But then two weeks later, bang, I'm back where I started from. Well, it was great to get pumped up emotionally. Nothing wrong with that. But it's the Holy Spirit that will take you forward day after day after day after day after day. Yep, it's relationship with the Holy Spirit and obedience to the Spirit. Let me finish with this. If you see a power then you'll want to get a hold of it. In Acts chapter 8, we've got the story of Simon the sorcerer. Anyone remember that story? And, and, and the believers come and they pray for the Holy Spirit to, to fill these people and, and, and they get filled with this. And Simon the sorcerer, he, he sees that and he realizes he's losing power because he was whatever he was doing, the people in the community called him uh, the great power of God. That was this nickname they had for him, the great power of God, because he was doing miracles. He was, but they weren't miracles from God. And so all of a sudden the believers come on in and they start doing something. And, and, and what does Simon do? He actually goes to the believers. He says, I will pay you if you'll give me the power to do that. And they just looked at him and said, it doesn't work like that. You don't get the power because it's not a force. It's relationship with a person. And you need to go away, Simon. And you need to repent of what's in your heart. So many of us, we want, who, who doesn't want to be used to do signs, wonders, and miracles? Who, who in this room does not want to lay their hands on a sick person and see him recover? Who does not want, yeah, I said who doesn't want to, and some people put their hands up. I had my hand up. I don't want that. No way. That's not what I meant. What I meant was, who wants to see miracles, signs, and wonders through their life in their generation? We all do. We all want it. Got it right that time. We all want that. But it's not going to come because we have uh, focus on a power and we're trying to get a power. It comes because we build relationship with a person and that person is the Holy Spirit. If you see a power, you'll want to get a hold of it. If you see a person, you'll want him to get a hold of you. you want him to get a hold of you. Holy Spirit, take a hold of my life. Teach me, guide me, have input, help me, shape me, mold me, let me deal with the stuff I've got to deal with. That's what we want. It's relationship with a person. If you see a power, you'll want to get a hold of it. You see a person, you want him to get a hold of you. Secondly, if you see a power, you'll want it to accomplish your own will and purposes. If it's just a power, you'll want to build your own ministry, build your own profile. You'll want to do what you want with that power when it's convenient for you. When it's not convenient, then, then no, this is my time. This is the If you just see a power, you're going to want that and you're going to want to use that for your own benefit and your own advancement. And we've seen that even in the Word of God with Simon. He wanted the power back. Why? Because people stopped looking at him and they started looking at Jesus. He said, no, no I, want, I want the reputation. I want the focus back here. I want people looking at me. Here's the money. Give me this power. But if you see a person, you'll surrender to his will and purpose. And life will become a series of divine partnerships between you and between God as we go about bringing the kingdom to earth and changing the world around us. One person and one act at a time. And thirdly, if you see a power, then we'll be proud we have it and we'll view ourselves as superior to other people. Well, look at me. Look what happened when I... Have you got that? Can you do that? Look at me. We'll think that we're superior. We'll get proud. And the more that God begins to move through us, the more things we begin to see, and the more that divine partnership builds, we'll get proud and arrogant and feel like it's a mark that we're more mature, we're more superior, we're better product than the person next to us. If we see a power, if we see a person, then we're going to be humbled that in spite of who we are, that divine person, 
the, 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 the member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, will be humbled that the Holy Spirit would take up residence inside of us and would use us to do some of the most amazing things. Jesus said, the works that I did, they're nothing. He said, you guys are going to do way more. You're going to do what I did and then some. But it's only going to happen as you embrace and develop relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Uh, let's just pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your presence in this place with us right now, God. And Lord, I just pray for each person that is here this morning, Father. Would you, even as this week rolls on, Lord, would you continue to open up our hearts to embrace relationship with the Holy Spirit, to have communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God, to put ourselves in the picture of these verses that you didn't leave me as an orphan, but you came to me and you dwell in me through the Holy Spirit, that you, you have come to teach me through the Holy Spirit, to guide me. Lord, you've come to continue the ministry of Jesus in my life, but also to continue the ministry of Jesus through my life, through the person of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for each one of us here in this next week. Just keep reminding us, keep reminding us that we're doing life with a divine person. We're doing life with the person of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve. We don't want to lie to you. We don't want to uh, quench you. We don't want to do any of that stuff. We want to build relationship in a positive way with you, Lord communion, talking, listening, all those things that go with personhood, Father. So Lord, I just pray for each of us as we continue down this journey of the Holy Spirit, would you take us into a new experience with the Holy Spirit, Lord? God, would you take us into a new season of understanding, God? Would you open our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, that we wouldn't just see words on a page, but God, bring it to life. And Father, in the next seven days, each person here that knows you, God, as we go out these doors in the next seven days, would you give every person in this room the opportunity Give us the opportunity to tell somebody about you, Father, somebody out there that right now is living hopelessly, somebody right now that can't see uh, down the track, they can't see the future, God, somebody right now that doesn't realize how precious they are to you, how special they are to you, how much you love them, and they don't understand what that whole Jesus story was about. Give us a chance this week to tell those people about who you are and what you did and why you did it, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.